Greetings. This is a TV1 universal scaler. It says so on the front. Unfortunately, the reason it's on my desk is that it's dead. We'll get to that in a moment, but first of all, let's take a look around it. On the back, it's got 12 volt power, Ethernet, and RS232 serial control connections, together with a 13 pin option port for plugging in additional TV1 kit. It's got four stereo audio inputs and one stereo audio output, all on a terminal strip, plus a plethora of other video inputs. It can take component video. It's got an RGB input for PC. It's got DVI-D digital input and presumably HDMI through that. It's got S video. It's got component uh, composite video. And it's got HDSDI, which is, although predominantly a broadcast standard, it's also used on some CCTV systems. For video output, once again, it's got S video, composite video, and HDSDI. Plus a DVI-I output, which can do VGA as well, otherwise they'd just use a DVI-D port. Around the front, it's got some mode selection buttons, which would probably make a lot more sense if it actually worked. A four-way joystick button, selectors for the various inputs, and an on-off button. One thing the option port can be used for is to connect this HDSDI video switcher. This replaces the single HDSDI input with eight, controllable from the scaler itself. Now remember I said it was dead. This is where it gets interesting because that switcher isn't plugged into a 12 volt supply. It's getting power from the scaler through the option port and the scaler is what's plugged into a 12 volt supply. Of course, it could just mean that the 12 volt input is directly linked to the option port. We'll have to open it and find out. Looks like someone's beaten me to it because one of the screws is missing and the warranty seal. connection was a bit loose, it wasn't that, was it? Would be that easy a fix. No. No such luck. It does have a fuse inside. I've come across these connections before. Obviously I've come across these connections before, but I'm used to these latches going out to the sides, not this way. tight fuse cover off I think that fuse is blown Blown its fuse. Not just a blown fuse, surely. 800s, 3, 400 milliamp, 2.15, 1 amp. It's a T1 amp, which is what the old one was as well. So, All I should do is check for short circuits to the case. Which there isn't. Can it be that easy a fix? All the views go pop straight away. starting up. <laughs> well that was a very easy fix wasn't it? 
But I'm not just going to put it back together. This was going to be a teardown anyway, and teardown it will be. Let's have a look inside and see what we've got. Apart from a working fuse. If you're hoping for a schematic this time, you've got no chance. But here's some close-ups of the boards, together with the details of each chip. So with it working, what can it do? Well, let's hook it up to a load of stuff and see what we've got. I've got monitors connected to the S-Video, Composite and both digital and analog feeds from the DVI output, with the HDSDI output going to a fifth monitor via a CCTV recorder. On the inputs, I've got a Nintendo Wii on the component input, an Xbox 360 on S-Video, an Amiga 600 on Composite, an Amiga 1200 on VGA, a CCTV camera on HDSDI, and a HD DVD player on DVI. Audio inputs are coming from the Wii, Amiga 600, Xbox 360 and the HD DVD player. The output is going to a pair of PC speakers and I've got the Ethernet port connected as well so that I can control it remotely. So this is getting almost every orifice filled tonight. The first thing to note is that not all the screens work simultaneously and that's because all outputs get the same scaled signal. Switch to standard definition PAL and the eAlma is happy to display it as are obviously the two CCTV monitors on the composite and S-Video outputs. It looks as though the SDI one is working, but that's actually frozen, as you can tell if I change one of the inputs. Switch to 1080i and the CCTV monitors go off, but the LG comes on. That error message on the e-armor, it's, it's actually functioning. I don't know why it displays out of range, it is actually working properly and, the, and that message eventually disappears. Switch to a 1080p resolution and the armor has gone, but the SDI recorder unfreezes itself. Now that's probably not an issue normally, as I'd expect this would only be typically driving one, maybe two outputs simultaneously, and not be expected to output two completely different resolutions at once. Something else that can have an effect is HDCP. With the HDCP protected input, only HDCP compatible outputs will display anything. And that means in this case, just the LG. The only way I was able to get the HD DVD player to display on more monitors was to either put my HDMI recorder in line with it, or use a cheap HDMI splitter, which seems to do the HDCP handshaking but then won't pass it on. At least that freed up the HDMI recorder so I could capture the PC display. The PC is running the Corio Tools suite which offers most of the features such as input switching, output resolution setting, edge blending and so on which can be done on the front panel but it can be done much quicker on the PC. So what's it like input wise? Well for the most part it's pretty good. Deinterlacing is brilliant. I've run both Amigas through the VGA input and even interlaced modes like the one you're seeing here are rock solid. Although switching between interlaced and non-interlaced modes might need a tweak to arrange the frames properly and that seems to be a front panel only job. It doesn't like you changing resolutions though. You end up having to readjust the screen size manually and although the unit allows you to store a number of different preset system settings and switch between them, these don't seem to be included. That might just be a quirk of dealing with the weird video settings that the Amiga tends to kick out though. Stick with one screen mode and as an upscaler for video capture or better monitor support, it's spot on. I'm not sure what's causing that blue tint by the way. It seemed to come and go and now it seems to be stuck in there, but notice in this particular resolution it's only affecting part of the screen. So I don't know what's going on there. It's got plenty of flexibility when it comes to inputs, as evidenced by me shoveling six different devices onto it. It's also got some other features of interest. One niche feature is edge blending, where you can fade the edge of the display. You'd use this, for example, if you've got two projector screens. You'd overlap the display slightly and use edge blending on both units to hide the joint. Another possibly more useful feature is the Genlock capability. This lets you overlay one image over the other. It's a little tricky to poke into action and some of the monitors can grumble about it. Let's have a go. If I choose SDI as a source and then I choose to mix it and key it now, if I choose the Amiga input, you can see that the icons are actually sh showing through to the original colour. If I invert it, it will make it a lot clearer. 
and you can adjust the, um, the settings here as well to adjust where the uh, the maximum and minimum thresholds are. This is something you could use for overlaying graphics or subtitles or possibly chroma keying a green screen or equivalent backdrop if you can get these settings right. demo by SDI, overlaid on a camera feed that's HD SDI, I'll put in HD SDI. You'll see that every day. Incidentally, I don't know if this or the filmed vectors demo ever got finished. I've not seen Pablo in at least 30 years and I never met DME. use the picture in picture feature to set one image inside another. This is all controlled through the front panel, there's no direct access to the PIP feature from the PC app. a very quick fix and a quick run through some of the capability of this TV1 scaler. Thanks for watching.